Ladies and gentlemen, we are approaching 9.30. It's actually 9.30 already. I aim to start this panel in, um, in a minute or so, so please take your seats. <laughs> All right, uh, welcome to this workshop on public diplomacy <coughs> versus disinformation are there red lines. My name is Sebastian Bay. I'm a senior expert with NATO Strategic Communications Center of Excellence in Latvia. We're a multinational accredited research body for NATO, so we don't speak on behalf of NATO, but we are NATO accredited. Uh, so I'm here today as the moderator. Um, we have myself, the uh, the offline moderator, and I'm also joined by an online moderator who will help me during today. And uh, the online moderator is Caroline Krenner from Microsoft. Uh, with, me, with us today on this panel as well, we have Felix Kart. He's the policy officer for External Action Service, working on EU's response to malign interference and election meddling online and offline, I assume. Uh, we have John Frank who is uh, the Vice President for EU Governmental Affairs at Microsoft. We have uh, Marilla Marcel, uh, who is a digi uh, digital uh, policy senior researcher at Diplo Foundation, which I um, know now is a nonprofit working to increase the role of small and developing states and to improve global governance and international policy development. And then we have Götz Fromholtz, uh, who works as a policy analyst for the Open Society, um, the European Policy Institute, and uh, he leads the advocacy work for the Open Society Foundations in Germany. Now, today we will discuss are there red lines, public diplomacy versus foreign interference. And this is a topic that <laughs> I personally have a lot of interest in. So I'm seconded to NATO Stratcom CUE from the Swedish Civil Contingency Agency, where I headed the election protection project in 2017 and 2018 where we set up the protection efforts post the interference into the US uh, 2016 elections. So the whole world came together after 2016, and realized what was happening and saw the need for an approach um, to handle this. And one of the core things to deal with was of course um, definitions of what is going on. Now this development hasn't gone away. Yes, we haven't had high profile cases like the 2016 presidential election, but we've seen an increase from 2015 in a threefold increase actually in cyber related incidents uh, during election processes. So recognizing this threat and the increasing trend here, uh, a lot of people, government, civil society, industry, uh, and different groups have tried to take actions to underscore the need for dialogue um, and to progress in different forms. We have the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace, and in 2018 there was the G7 commitment to defending democracy from foreign threats. Uh, the UN has done work on this. We've seen a lot of national work on this. We have seen a lot of work at, uh, at the European Union, for example. Now, the purpose of this panel is to talk a little bit around definitions and try to see if we can move forward in trying to understand what is, what is um, disinformation, what is interference, how do we relate that to the normal processes of public policy. Now, foreign interventions in democratic elections, they happen for several different reasons. And um, while some of it can be seen as a normal toolbox of democratic states, and we see that states interfere in other states' businesses, and that interference range from normal diplomacy to negotiations, provisions of aid, and in the most extreme cases, interventions, movement of troops, uh, sanctions, and ultimately war. Now, for both malign actors and legitimate actors who seek to promote democracy or a particular political agenda, many of these tactics can look similar. 
from disseminating rumors to damaging <coughs> rival candidates of credibility, especially when you look at national and local processes, it can be difficult to distinguish between these things. When we look at the international level, it can be even more difficult to see, well, what should we see as malign or hostile interference and what is legitimate interference in these issues. Now, we brought together a group of experts on a panel organized uh, by uh, Microsoft. Um, and we hope to talk uh, and facilitate a discussion among the actors on this panel on Ford interference versus the use of dis disinformation versus the use of public diplomacy. Can we draw a red line? Can we distinguish what is illegitimate and what is legitimate influence? Now, to start off this discussion, and I hope to lay out this with introductory remarks from the panelists, um, I will moderate a discussion. I have a few questions of my own, which I will pose to the, um, to the panelists to try to further understand what is uh, what is going on in this topic, and then I hope to open it up to the floor and to online audiences. Is there anything that the online moderator wants to say about participation in, uh, in the online streaming here? Um, you, can, uh, you can find us, uh, the tool to ask questions online on the, the IGF website, so we are looking forward to your questions. All right, um, let's not wait any further, but let's kick this off with some introductory remarks. Um, <coughs> I've uh, set the order of um, uh, Felix, John, Götz, and Marilia. So um, let's uh, start with you, Felix. Let's start. Do I have to press any button here? Yes. Okay, thanks a lot, Sebastian. Uh, well, first of all, I think um, while this discussion is uh, very important, there are very obvious red lines already, and that's especially when uh, national election laws apply. And I don't think we have a very systematic overview of that, especially at EU level. But of course, uh, disinformation campaigns uh, deliberately operate in gray zones usually where there is precisely no applicable law to hold them accountable. Uh, and I think to, to cover these, um, these gray zones a bit better in the future, I think we should start out possibly by looking a little bit on at how we think um, disinformation and online manipulation impacts different human rights. I don't think we have had this discussion to a sufficient extent yet. Um, Anyway, so at, at, at the EAS, the European uh, the EU's External Action Service, uh, we have kind of set up the first EU-level attempt to counter uh, malign interference at an operational level. Um, now the, the incoming commission has put democratic resilience quite high on the agenda, which I think opens a window of opportunity for us to think about how to beefing up and extending our current approach. I think that in particular there are three things that we want to think about doing. First of all, before we actually set out a definition, I think we still need to be clearer on why we actually think we are mandated to address uh, disinformation and manipulative interference. Why is this of concern to us as governments? Um, secondly, and as you say, and that's the purpose of the panel, uh, we should define more clearly what kind of uh, state behavior or state-backed behavior we think is unacceptable. And uh, thirdly, and I think that may even be the most important part, we have to enable democratic actors, and by that I mean civil society researchers, but also a law enforcement authorities where law applies to, to uh, identify and monitor uh, threats to a democracy. So um, on the first point, uh, to a little bit find uh, the, the, or identify the normative background against which we are operating, uh, I think we should make very clear in what ways we think disinformation campaigns constitute threats to democracy. Uh, we have talked a lot about privacy, about the freedom of expression in the past, but I think there may be other human rights at stake that we have not really assessed so far that may include uh, the freedom of thought, the right to vote, or the, 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 the freedom to, to form and hold opinions free from interference. Um, secondly, when we talk about norms and rules, I think we also need further discussion on the conditions under which we think disinformation campaigns can actually constitute an act of interference. Um, on the second point, 
uh, now that we are actually talking about how to define uh, such behavior, unacceptable behavior, or these red lines. Um, as you probably know, my colleagues from the uh, EU versus Disinfo project at the EAS have so far mostly uh, focused on exposing outright lies spread by a Russian state media. Um, that also reflects the European Commission's current definition of disinformation as verifiably false content. And I think we should, uh, we should really uh, continue and strengthen that work. However, we see, of course, that the playbook of threat actors is much broader than just spreading false content. It's, as you all know, uh, very often about, for instance, manipulating divisive domestic debates without necessarily early spreading content that uh, would be debunked by fact checkers or anything like that. Another reason besides these operational constraints is that sometimes it may seem illegitimate in the eyes of many for public institutions to act on the basis of a merely content-based definition. We've all been called Ministry of Truth many times. Um, yeah, so in, on the way forward, I think many uh, EU member states have in fact already developed quite useful operational uh, definitions of, of information manipulation in the French case or malign interference, I think the Swedish called it. Um, and I think it would be worth exploring to what extent we can streamline these different national definitions into a common EU approach. To give about one example, and Sebastian, I think you have been very in, uh, closely involved in the process of, of drafting your government's approach to election interference. Um, the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency uses the four variables of deception, intention, disruption, and interference. Um, so, however, uh, once we have a more uh, straightforward uh, problem definition, uh, we should clearly all together encourage online platforms to also work with us on that basis. Um, I was very delighted uh, and surprised to uh, read yesterday that uh, all the big platforms have signed up to a new contract for the web, uh, web which includes, I think it's under principle six, that they are planning to report on how they uh, assess and address the risks cre uh, created by disinformation on their platforms. That would be a huge leap forward because that's not really the practice we have been witnessing so far on their part. Um, as most of you will know, it's currently uh, completely impossible for any independent outsider to verify whether elections have been compromised by, uh, via these platforms or not. We have no idea about the actual scale of covert uh, interference campaigns on Facebook or Google. All we get from uh, Facebook, for instance, are like these sporadic news blogs when they tell us we took down another seven networks from Russia, but we have no idea how they attributed that kind of behavior. We have no idea uh, what the scope and impact may have been uh, of that kind of behavior. So more transparency is clearly in order and I think and hope that the <coughs> Commission will also address this through regulatory measures. Well, that's pretty much it. Thank you, Felix. I think that's interesting. Um, I mean, we all want to go from the whack-a-mole approach to a more strategic approach where we can prevent. Um, it's interesting, one of the things you said when we talk about behaviors is that um, we've used behaviors as a way to stay away from having to define exactly what it's about. Uh, in Sweden in 2017, as we prepared, we often talked about you know, specific behaviors to, let, uh, to help the election management bodies understand what is, what is interference that we cannot accept and what is not. And I thought one of the things that was a clear red line uh, that we used was to separate interference into the election management systems, i.e. trying to hack or undermine the infrastructure surrounding elections, um, voter disenfranchisement that is targeting the will and ability of voters to participate in elections, and then as a third pillar, uh, political interference, which is, more, uh, which is more difficult to define and which is something that we, to a large extent, stayed away from. Instead, as a state, we focused and targeted primarily uh, countering interference into the election infrastructure and uh, voter disenfranchisement. Um, so it's interesting talking about behaviors there. Um, I'm going to leave it to John, uh, representing Microsoft, to give his introductory remarks. I'd like to talk about 
what we know today and, and how, much, um, how much basis there is in international law and in political discussions about where the lines may be. Um, on the ride over today, I went by the actual Springer office, which is a, a tall building, uh, and before the fall of the wall, it was essentially used as a giant billboard to project Western news into Eastern Berlin, Eastern German. Um, the participation of countries in other countries' affairs by what we call public diplomacy um, is, is a long established and broadly considered to play an important role in civil society. Um, and so if we think about where lines are, we know there's some positive things. Uh, and so, you know, BBC broadcasts around the world. Uh, it is a professional journalistic organization. It has a perspective, um, but it isn't trying to provide information around the world. Um, RT is an interesting example because it sometimes you could say it is offering that perspective and it is a major news source uh, online uh, and yet sometimes the news is seeded with what might be considered propaganda uh, and so then you run into the issue of like the Ofcom in the UK is investigating um, the broadcaster of RT in the UK for uh, is it abiding by uh, the rules of impartiality for broadcasters. But, but still the fact that RT continues to operate would indicate that that's on the side of public diplomacy. Um, in the political process there are national groups including the National Democratic Institute and the International Republican Institute from the United States which actively go out and work with political parties on building democratic infrastructure. Um, and, and so that, I think those are broadly accepted to be on the, if you will, the, the clear side. Um, and then we run into information operations on the other side, which raise concerns. Uh, I'd hoped that international law would provide some clarity as I try to sort out where this line might be. Uh, and, and I read several learned papers on international law, and I came away with the conclusion international law is not there yet. Um, we need to begin to have customary uh, declarations at the political level before we can hope to get to international rules that are actually uh, helpful in the space. Uh, digress for just a second, there's, there's this question of sovereignty as a, is it a principle or is it a rule? And that's kind of where the debate is today. Um, France and, and the Netherlands have come out strongly, and I believe Estonia, that it is a rule which um, in the international system must be abided by. Um, the UK and formally and the US informally take the position that it's a principle. Uh, which can't be, you know, from which you can't really derive specific rules. So international law today is not super helpful. Uh, when President Obama, himself a law professor, um, addressed the Russian interference in 2016 in the U.S. election, um, he did not characterize it as a violation of international law, but, quote, efforts to undermine established international norms of behavior and interfere with democratic governance. So it's a political statement that he made about established international norms of behavior. Now, consensus on this point, uh, I think the, the leading source that one can point to is a G7 statement, which of course just represents the group of seven countries, but also the Paris call um, for trust and security in cyberspace, which is a multi-stakeholder document that was launched a year ago at the inaugural Paris Peace Forum. Um, today, um, the Paris call has 77 nation state signatories um, and signatories totaling 1,034 uh, from 85 countries around the world. Um, and there's, a, there's nine principles in it 
um, and actually there are challenges which signatories promise to work on together. And one of them is strengthen our capacity pr to prevent malign interference by foreign actors aimed at undermining electoral processes through malicious cyber activities. So that's, that's I'd say, the, the most uh, broadly accepted political statement we have that guides us. Um, now, when we try to think about, well, how do you look at different activities and decide whether or not they are that malign interference by foreign actors? Domestic political activities, we know we're going to have many of the same elements of persuasion and sometimes deception, but those are outside the scope. Um, there's, a broad, there's a sense that within a domestic political process, the rough and tumble of politics should enable far more there. But when foreign actors participate, it's different. And so I want to propose really five criteria um, that we can look at. The first is transparency, probably the most important. When, when a country is transparent about what it is doing, um, it is much harder for somebody to object that it is malign interference. Uh, and so um, after he left office, President Obama recorded and posted a YouTube video where he endorsed Emmanuel Macron for president of France. It was clear that it was him. He's clearly not French, but he's offering a, a perspective uh, of, of his experience to the French voters where he's highly regarded. I say that fully transparent. Uh, the, the activities of the National Democratic Institute and the IRI, again, fully transparent. Then the next question comes up, the extent of deception involved in an information operation. Uh, this is where you, you start, um, truth is a very tough thing to, to define, but deception is an easier a measurement of, of malign activity. Uh, and so, um, you know, in the 2016 election, um, you know, there was uh, the Senate report talks about, uh, you know, efforts to seed de divisiveness by feeding in some deceptive information. And so, in the classic example, the Black Lives Matter group were told that there was a a protest being staged uh, by a white supremacist. Uh, a white nationalist group was told there was a protest staged by Black Lives Matter, and the, and the intent was to get them to show up at the same place and lead to civil, civil unrest. Um, so the, the extent of deception is important. But there's also a purpose test as the third criteria I'd suggest. Um, and so this we get into um, questions about what you're trying to do. Right Now, if a government hacks another government's electoral system to change the voter registration rolls, uh, the process of voting and counting and publishing the voting, I think most people would agree that's clearly on the, on the other side. That's not public diplomacy. That's probably foreign intervention and probably a clear violation of international law. But what about doxing? Um, you know, we saw the Democratic National Committee's email servers hacked and documents released. Um, and so was the purpose of that to expose criminal behavior or was the purpose to sow dissent? Um, last May, the Austrian government fell when a videotape came to the, uh, to the, to the public. Uh, and it was a tape of the far right party leader offering to trade public contracts for cash political donations. Was that foreign interference or was the purpose there to expose criminal activity? Um, and so you can have discussions around purpose. I'm not sure there's a clear answer, but I just offer those two points as an example. The other scale, and especially in today's world where social media and the internet allow inauthentic actors the capacity to amplify through bots and inauthentic accounts um, and with cross-platform strategies to very quickly uh, execute campaigns of viral deception. And so scale in this process does matter. Uh, and finally, I think the fifth point you'd look at is what it affects. Um, if, uh, you know, if a campaign doesn't really have effect, um, you know, that's, 
it's harder to complain about. But on the other hand, if you're a lawyer trying to advise whether or not uh, an information operation is appropriate, um, knowing the effect is pretty hard to do before you start. So those are just some thoughts about um, we need to tease out and, and have discussions about which, which side of the line different activities go on. We also need to think about how do we address this, not just through law, but through increasing resilience by ensuring we've got appropriate domestic laws that regulate foreign engagement in campaigns um, and, and also uh, create transparency um, on social media platforms precisely so we can understand what's going on. Thank you for that intervention, John. Proposing a test of five questions, transparency, deception, purpose, scale, and effect. I think we take that with us, um, because at least scale and effect are two new ones that I haven't heard before. Um, so let's continue to Marilia and your opening statement. Thank you, Sebastian. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Microsoft, for the, for the invitation. Um, I think that there are some principles that are recurrent in this debate that we're having here, such as non-intervention, sovereignty, self-determination, and these are all principles that have been enshrined in international law. So my first observation is that although international law will not give us very precise answers to the problems that we're facing here, I do not think that we are in a position to put aside international law completely. Um, we are in a moment in which perhaps we need to reinterpret international law to the context in which we are, we are living. Um, we need to see how we would apply international law. However, we do have some important principles in place that we need to take into account. I would add to these international law principles the concept of stability. Um, this is a concept that has been very dear to the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. Um, this is a commission that has a multi-stakeholder composition. It worked for, for three years, thinking, reflecting on the context, context of stability of cyberspace. And they have just released their final report. Um, and this report contains several norms on what is acceptable, a state behavior, non-governmental behavior in cyberspace, and how we can preserve cyber stability. And among these norms, one of them deals specifically with the period of elections. Um, Public, uh, political warfare, in fact, affects all these principles that we have been discussing here. Um, however, political warfare uses an arsenal of different tools, which are not only informational operations, but also cyber attacks. So we can interfere in elections by disrupting the infrastructure layer um, that enables elections to take place in the first uh, place, such as uh, tampering with uh, electronic booths or uh, software that, uh, that allows elections to be uh, carried out. And that, of course, uh, targets confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data, but it also has an emotional aspect too. So I think it relates to the debate that we're having here. Um, our discussions are more focused on the cognitive informational layer, but I think that there's a growing relation between uh, cyber operations carried out against infrastructure and uh, information operations. As we saw in the 2016 uh, elections, Russia used both uh, disinformation and attacks against um, infrastructure, as has been uh, reported by the, the Homeland Security in the US to destabilize uh, elections. So the Global Commission recognized that the discussions on the problem of information interference is very important. However, if we don't have infrastructure in place, elections cannot take place. So this perhaps is a problem that we need um, to consider in advance. Um, so the norm that they have proposed uh, says that state and non-state actors must not pursue, support, or allow cyber operations intended to disrupt the technical infrastructure essential to elections, referenda, or plebiscites. Um, that are currently, as we will see in our discussions, and we see even more acutely in the different parts of the world, different legal, political views on the threshold of interference that will constitute illegitimate or unlawful interference. Um, but we believe that a good place to start a discussion is a norm that protects the electoral infrastructure um, because it is essential to rally support of the different parties that are engaged in this conversation. And rallying support has become 
fundamental to the non-binding norms that are being proposed uh, on the discussions of cybersecurity, because galvanizing support gives us a path to understand what is acceptable and non-acceptable behavior in, in cyberspace. So I invite you to read the report and attend the session that will take place uh, this afternoon, um, in which the Commission will present the different uh, norms, including this norm on elections. Um, but apart from that, I think that uh, observation that I would like to make is that the discussion about this information on elections has been marked by terms that carry a very acute degree of subjectivity, and I think that this is not contributing to the debate. Um, we ask ourselves what is legitimate or illegitimate interference, but these concepts are very hard to deal with. There is a huge debate on political social silence, uh, sciences about legitimacy, and that this not really takes us uh, uh, anywhere. And if we have seen, uh, historically speaking, Western democracies uh, have been interfering in other Western democracies um, for a very long time. Um, there is a study that has documented uh, more than 117 um, incidents of interferences coming both from the US and Russia in the time between 46 and, and 2000. So coming myself from Latin America, a region that has a long history of US interference in elections in several countries such as Brazil, and Venezuela, Nicaragua, and, and so on, I feel that the distinction between foreign policy and interference has been largely casuistic. And by framing the debate in terms of legitimate and illegitimate interference, or good intentions and malicious intentions, we are perhaps using words that are not very, um, contributing very much to the debate that we're having here. I think a better place to start is what John was telling us, um, and the criteria that he used here, which has been proposed by different uh, schoolers. Um, uh, Duncan Hollis has worked on criteria, um, and Michael Smith as well. So I think that there are, there are criteria out there that are help, helping us to steer the way um, in these discussions. There are also documents that have been published by organizations. Um, the Council of Europe has a very good report um, from 2017 on information disorder. I think this report proposes, first of all, two very important questions. The first of them is, is the information information based on reality or is the information completely false and what is the intent behind the information and by answering these two questions we can perhaps categorize uh, um, um, information disorder into three different uh, clusters we can talk about this information which is information that is false and is, create, is created with the intention to create to, to do harm. We can talk about misinformation, um, information that is false, but not created specifically with the intention to create harm. And we can talk about malinformation, information that is based on reality, uh, but is used in a, in a particular context to inflict harm. And perhaps the, the answer, the way that we address these different types of information disorder should be different as well. The report also does something that I find very interesting. It tries to decouple um, an, an information disorder into three phases, the phase of creation of information, production of information, transforming that idea into a media that is consumed online, and the dissemination and further replication of the information. And the motives of the actors acting behind each one of these phases are very different. Some motives are politicals, political, but the motives of the trolls that disseminate the information online are mostly economical, for example. So in order to tackle the problem, it's important to decouple on that. And I think we need to take into account um, the lessons of uh, uh, Lessing, Laurel Lessing, um, which are still relevant today, um, that we need to tackle the regulation of internet phenomena taking into account laws, norms, uh, technical solutions, and economic activities. Economic act activities in particular, I think are very um, important because the operational logic behind uh, platforms today gives more visibility um, to misinformation, and the more clicks they have in their platforms, the better. So transparency in reports is a good first step to address the problem, and it's a, it's a welcome step. But these platforms are based on algorithms and um, filter bubbles that are being exploited to disseminate this information. So we have made our social media the public spheres where our public debate is taking place. Should we have done that 
is this really healthy for our democracies? And if social media acquire this importance in our democracies, are their current business models and standards acceptable? Should we intervene um, on these standards? I think that these are, these are open uh, questions that we need to address. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one interesting thing that I thought you brought up that uh, went back to what uh, I talked about how we dealt with this in Sweden is the clear red line when it comes to attacking uh, election infrastructure and how we can work with that. Um, so I thought that was, um, that was interesting. Uh, but also looking at the chain of disinformation production, which comes at, of course, at, at a different aspect of this. Um, the chain is interesting because there's different motifs there that are involved. Okay, good. Um, the floor is yours. Great. So, thank you very, very much for having me on this panel as well. As Open Society Foundations, we are an organization that's deeply embedded in civil society, um, mostly through our grant making. And we've been trying for a while now to understand the effects of disinformation uh, false narratives and so forth through uh, multiple research projects we've been uh, funding uh, through our uh, grantees. Right now we are probably spending about seven and a half million dollars a year on trying to understand this phenomenon uh, that is threatening democracies all over the world, but especially uh, I think what we call um, the West. So. What we do is basically, we do um, concentrate on, of course, on disinformation, but also abuse of personal data, monopoly of power, intensifying economic equality, and of course, also online discrimination. And because we are so diverse in what we are looking at, we try to find a more holistic view on how to approach um, this topic on uh, disinformation, especially from the viewpoint of um, an NGO. And uh, just to give you an idea of who we are working with, uh, we work with the uh, EU Disinfo Lab, but also in Germany, um, many of you may know the Stiftung Neue Verantwortung. And what we have been always been pointing at, or been our, what our grantees have been pointing us at, is like uh, demos that we are definitely living in a post-fake news era. So it's very important, and I do not want to stress the very important point uh, that my uh, co-panelists have already pointed out, the issue of transparency. Um, it is very important, especially in the issue when we're talking now about false narratives. Many of you may already be um, comfortable with that term or know that term when tiny bits of real information, like statistics on migration, for example, is used in political agendas to uh, form a continuous narrative that, for example, like uh, political organizations in Germany do that, try to use this kind of data to frame that migrants in Germany are speci specifically uh, criminals and uh, they are part of that narrative to um, strengthen Germany's point on migration. So we are looking not only at single point disinformation, but disinformation put in a larger context of stories. And being part of civil society, we always look at narratives, we always look at stories, because stories are what change perceptions <laughs> and values within societies. And this is probably uh, the most important thing that concerns us in our work when we look at the use of disinformation today. Um, John mentioned RT as an important player in this case because RT is working on a large scale to provide a parallel a narrative to what we measure or to, in comparison to the reality we can empirically actually measure. And that's very, very important. But it's not only um, news stations like RT, we must not forget, for example, Fox News in the United States as well. I mean, we've just recently had the issue that Fox News uh, helped sharing the uh, conspiracy theory that our deputy chair, uh, Alex Soros, is act would actually be the whistleblower in the United States, which is, of course, prosperous and totally, to be frank, uh, an idiotic assumption. 
but organizations like that and platforms like that do add to narratives that actually harm the public opinion, that harm uh, society, and this is something we should definitely take a look at. But how should we do that? I mean, as open society, we are, of course, first and uh, almost um, for all, defenders of basic human rights. So our perspective is, of course, we do not support just cracking down on content on platforms. Of course, we do believe that content has to be some sort of, um, has to have a quality check. But to go into the direction and just assume that everybody's personal opinion, even though it might be disinformation, is still in the realm of free speech, is free speech at many points. And this is something we have to take into account, and this is something we need to measure when it comes to harmful content. There need to be red lines, of course, we all agree that illegal content needs to be uh, taken down from the internet, like child pornography or uh, terrorist propaganda, of course, but then we need to find out ways how to measure actually harmful content. And in our, from our point of view, this can be definitely things like hate speech, harmful content is definitely something that uh, changes the uh, opinion of entire groups within society towards a more radical point of view, which is run straight parallel to the empirically measured reality we can actually observe and explain. So that's definitely a threat. But we do not see yet that we really have tools to um, address these issues. So I do have, basically, when we're talking about disinformation, false narratives, and things like that, we need to address two key messages, which is on the basis of accountability. So on the one hand, of course, we need to have transparency, but we, need to, we also need to take those people into uh, account and make them accountable who spread this news. So what we need is we need to bring legal certainty to the liability regime of internet platforms for third-party content. That's one important thing. And we need to tackle disinformation and the manipulation of public opinion by supporting, in this case here, uh, Germany, in the EU-wide approach of upgrading electoral law for digital eras. So these are tools that can help us understand further countering disinformation and narratives. But to be quite frank, I think we're still very much in the beginning, and we still need to understand a lot, especially between the connection between online uh, behavior and offline behavior, and there's a huge black box we still need to understand whether and how online disinformation actually really influences offline behavior. And with this, I'd like to close my remarks. Thank you. Felix was trying to protect his microphone. <laughs> um, thank you, Götz, for that uh, initial statement, um, talking more about uh, the need for a holistic view, focusing on content, looking at transparency and accountability, and also raising the question of uh, online versus offline, both in terms, I assume, of uh, consequences, what are the actual effects of this, uh, but also, I guess, uh, in the two different domains of influencing both online and offline. And thank you for those initial statements. I think we've seen um, uh, proposals that are overall uh, rather in line. We'll see if you agree with that statement. But we've seen uh, areas that don't fully overlap as well. I'm going to switch microphones. <laughs> so the way we're going to progress this discussion now is that I'm going to, I'm going to do some statements. And um, I'm going to propose questions to the panelists. Uh, I actually think I should not use this microphone we're getting static interference. So my first statement goes back to um, the definition issue. And we are here, of course, to, to figure out how can we define uh, what is legitimate. And the supporters of the Parrots call, they committed to prevent interference in electoral processes. But what is then interference? Now, uh, during the Swedish election, we commissioned Lund University and Professor James Parman to draw up a research paper called Countering Hostile Influence, the State of the Art, which you can find online. So um, Professor Parman in this paper, he argues that on a single incident, you cannot fully decide if this 
single case um, is illegitimate. However, if you look at a chain of an events analysis and you look at several cases, you can determine whether or not something is legitimate or illegitimate using what also Felix mentioned, the DD diagnostic framework, deception, intention, disruption, and interference. I'm going to explain that uh, shortly to you. Um, so this is based on one, information influence activities contain, contain deceptive elements. Techniques of information influence obscure, mislead, and disinform. They are deceptive by nature. Two, illegitimate activities are not interested in contributing to constructive solutions of a problem. They intend to do harm. For an example, by stoking opposition on both sides. John mentioned the um, Black Lives Matter example where internet research agency meddled on both sides of um, the discussion, actually by fictitiously creating both groups as well. Three, information influence activities are disruptive. They not only intend to do harm, but they really do. For an example, it's evidenced by destruction of property, uh, creating riots, uh, contributing to um, civil, um, um, to different form of civil unrest, for an example. Um, and four, information influence activities constitute interference. Uh, foreign information ac influence activities, sometimes via domestic proxies, interfere in domestic democratic processes and the sovereignty of state. They interfere where they are not necessarily mandated to be. They are somewhere else. So taking those four, uh, those four words, they are deceptive, they have intent to disrupt, and they are disruptive by nature, and they constitute interference. Now, the DD framework says that this will help us draw a red line. Um, we've had different injects here, and uh, we've heard people propose a number of other terms as well. But I'm going to take it at that, and the first question will be, is it this simple? Is this all we need? Is it possible to sit down and using simple terms to, uh, to draw a line? And um, I'm going to go... Um, backwards this time, so I'm going to open by gets, and I say, how do you relate to those four terms? Are they useful from your perspective in a way of uh, deciding what is uh, illegitimate interference? They are definitely good uh, indicators to measure, to get, a, to get a bearing on these issues, but uh, as a social scientist, of course, I do not only like to put things on, uh, on indicators, but there's much more complexity to it. And uh, like I said uh, in my, in my um, remarks, we need to take a look at the online world, how the online world functions, how it's been used by the governments, but also by civil society, which is not always good. The case is also parts of bad civil society. So all different actors. So we also need uh, to take a, specifically take a look uh, at actors and um, not only use these three points, but I think very much, is, and that's been stressed in this panel already, that we also need to measure with a level of transparency about these issues. So if somebody is um, posting information, we need to know from who it comes from, what it is. And, and this is a very good degree to measure, for example, deceptiveness. So the less transparent something is, the more likely it is to be disinformation. So I think we need more indicators, we need more variables into, into this entire thing, because there's a lot more to understand than we already know right now. Thank you for that. So Marilia, you talked about um, stability. Stability as a component of understanding whether or not something is illegitimate, if I understood you right. If you think about the DD framework and the, uh, the terms proposed, is stability part there, or is there another component which we need to understand what is illegitimate? Thank you. I think that it proposes a good framework, and I think all these frameworks, that they are useful to us as methods of approaching the situation and trying to decouple the different uh, elements of the situation. So they give us a step-by-step -step to try to understand where we stand. 
Um, I think that the, that the scale that has been added by, by John is something interesting because uh, this information is not something new, um, but the scale in which we see the easiness with which people can produce this information and disseminate this information is something that we haven't seen before. So perhaps it calls for either new regulation or an interpretation of the regulation that we had before because we are confronted uh, with new, new phenomena. However, when, once we have a clear method, a clear approach to the problem, we need to ask ourselves, uh, what now? So what do we do if we are confronted with a situation that is indeed destabilizing, and I think that stability is an important concept to, to put to the table, then what do we do? How do we make actors act together? That's why I believe that norms are important as a first step um, to make actors coalesce around an understanding that leads to action, do something, or inaction, refrain from doing something. And we need to use the international law instruments um, that we have. I think your, your, your next question is more related to the, to the instruments of international law. And I think we need to understand in which situations human rights can be helpful as a framework, um, um, sovereignty can be helpful as a framework, non-interference, and how do we interpret these uh, principles that are legally binding in the situations that we come across. Mm. Thank you, and I'm going to, uh, because I got a question from Felix, I'm just going to say now that if you don't agree with each other, uh, please uh, ask for, for, uh, for injects, and I'll be more than happy to, to welcome uh, questions. Um, I'm going to save up my questions until we've done this first round, and then I'm going to uh, do more uh, uh, interactive injects here. So, John, you mentioned effects and scale, and I think, uh, I think that's interesting. But effects is difficult in the sense that we don't know that until afterwards, right? So uh, how can we use that to determine when something is happening, whether or not it's over the line? Is it only useful in, in hindsight? That's, that's a really good question. I think the answer is um, it depends. Um, there are instances, of course. I mean, with the scale of what you're, tr you know, the scale of what you're trying to do, uh, you know, maybe it's the perp you know, time more to purpose as opposed to actual scale of effects. Um, and we do have this long history, and and Marilla's, Marilla's point is is a very fair one, which is, it's highly subjective as to, um, you know, there's well known foreign interference by governments around the world and and things that. Um, you know, if they were transparent, people would have a problem with. Um, and, and yet that's been kind of an accepted dark arts of intelligence agencies and um, for some time. But it is different today, it seems, where there's this asymmetry of open societies having virtually everyone connected to information sources in a very immediate way that just invites um, it invites efforts, an asymmetrical attack on, uh, you know, civil, civil discourse. Uh, and so I think that, um, you know, I think that maybe the scale I would come back to is being, well, what are we doing to create resilience and maybe turning down the opportunity for foreign interference? Uh, and so I thought it was, you know, um, I thought it was a very positive step personally, you know, when Twitter decided they were not going to take political advertising because they, they don't feel they can control its impacts on their, uh, on, on their platform. And, you know, Google, I think, has announced they're going to limit the targeting, the micro-targeting of, of their advertising platform, uh, again, because they can't necessarily control the scale uh, and, and know what the impacts are. And so maybe it's a cautionary principle. Um, and you know, certainly uh, on Microsoft's ad network, we decided not to carry political advertising at all. Um, so um, it's, it's a, you know, there's it's obviously one company that's out there that, that is, um, believes it's important to its business and to its, you know, the, to who they are to continue with their current practices, and I hope they'll reconsider at least putting in some safeguards because 
really is the scale of reach of the internet uh, that this group has helped create uh, that does create the asymmetric possibility of interference. I think there is a lot of use to that, to thinking about scale and effect. And uh, definitely, as you said, it's highly difficult to do that in hindsight, but that we still need to take that into effect to some extent. And I think that's... So, Felix, you, um, you started by agreeing with the DD framework. So it's good to stop here to some extent, or at least proposing it as, as a way to, to look at these issues. We've heard three... Quoting three it, yes. oh, quoting it, okay. So, uh, well, that was a good question. Do you agree with it? Then you'll, you'll come back to that. But also these other things we've heard about scale, effect, mm -hmm. uh, talking about stability, going back to content. Is there mm -hmm. anything you disagree with that you've heard so far? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I do think it's a, it can be a useful framework. First of all, I just wanted to say, like, uh, as I understand uh, the headline of this panel, we are not uh, looking to uh, to basically create a new research design or find standards by which to censor individual speech. We're actually looking for variables by which to assess the legitimacy of state behavior. And I think that is a very important distinction that I just want to make here again. Then in theory, I would certainly agree with the need to look at scale and also effect. But as you just mentioned, that is currently with the current lack of transparency and common standards to assess and measure that kind of behavior, it is impossible. I mean, um, we all keep referring back to the examples of the 2016 US elections. So either in the meantime, um, we're having a fake discussion or we simply don't have enough access to evidence to, to, to talk about more recent examples. And I know that there are more recent examples. So um, yeah, while in theory, I really do agree on the need to find measures for scale and impact. I don't think it should keep us from uh, taking this discussion forward on the kind of normative principles that we uh, want to see complied with in information space by states, because it would basically take a very long while to get there. You're right. We're here to talk about state behavior, but at the same time, this is becoming more, much more complex. Um, yesterday, I spoke on a panel and I talked about a recent example. We're looking at, um, I was uh, looking at a, um, at a case in Nigeria where you see a a Nigerian company using Russian software, content productions from the Philippines, and being leveraged by both state and non-state actors. In a context like that, of course, attributing to states is highly complex and probably not possible at all. So what do you think? I mean, how do we relate to that, uh, and the fact that we can't often attribute to state behavior in that sense? Well, I think attribution in other areas such as cyber is also extremely complex and difficult, and it ultimately comes down to political calls. Um, I totally agree, but I mean, uh, we can still progress on the accuracy and transparency of attribution nonetheless, because we do uh, see the platforms attributing to Russia, to Iran, uh, to North Korea, Saudi Arabia, and it would just be I think from my perspective, um, amazing if they could include in this methodological discussion a broader circle of, of trusted researchers, whatever, just to make sure that they're doing their job well and uh, in, in uh, keeping elections uh, safe and clean if already we are outsourcing that job to private companies, which I find problematic. And in terms of reporting, I do find it very telling that in their, in their transparency reports, for instance, I think they're quarterly, they would tell us about the volume of takedowns uh, based on their adult nudity policies, for instance, but nowhere there will they systematically report on the degree of foreign interference or election manipulation campaigns, so there is no interface where I can find that kind of information as a policymaker, and I find that very problematic. Two points. Uh, one is we, in fact, do make an effort to create more deterrence and discouragement by announcing when we detect um, foreign actors attacking political clients, customers of ours. And so we've announced that RGU affiliated groups were attacking the United States Senate the um, Hudson Institute, uh, German Marshall Fund, uh, and the European Council on Foreign Relations, 
We also announced an Iranian uh, set of attacks on another set of customers. Um, so we do call out those things, in part because it's important to create more transparency and accountability. Hopefully that will discourage people. Um, but I, you know, it, it is a fair point that we don't, you know, by, we, not everybody puts in transparency reports foreign interference, but I gotta say, it's not so easy to know, right? And if there was some secret data in the back drawer that said, oh, here's the, you know, here's the secret report, uh, why don't you share it? That'd be one thing. But, you know, I think we saw that, you know, some of the best work that was done on detecting it wasn't by the companies themselves. It was when the United States Senate um, hired, um, you know, some, some really good researchers to go through the data sets to put together analysis. So um, that does lead to the question of we, de we need to make sure we're, we have regulatory frameworks that, that create access to data for governments so they can be evaluating these things. Yes, for, for governments and even more so uh, for researchers as well, I think, because we are still not talking about illegal con uh, categories of behavior or content. So I think it would be good to have a bit more of um, a bit more of transparency for, for society at large and especially for researchers who actually know uh, to do the kind of detection and attribution work much better than either governments or the platforms themselves do. Because if we look at the most of the major takedowns on Facebook and Twitter recently, it was most of the time based on tip-offs that they received indeed from, from NGOs or from researchers. So I think they need to have a, a much bigger role in that. But otherwise, I agree, of course. But uh, just to say, because you said, um, of course, it's not easy for platforms to um, detect foreign interference, but it would be soothing to know that at least they're looking for it and to understand how they define it. Can I just agree? Uh, there's cer certain things like when the customer shows up offering to pay in rubles, uh, you should, might think that that's not the currency of the campaign. Right? <laughs> But, and, and there is a very good report by the Oxford uh, Internet Institute uh, that does talk about seven different countries having foreign influence operations on social media. And so it calls out China, India, Iran, Pakistan, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and Venezuela um, as, uh, as countries based upon their research. So I think, there, you know, I, I think it is very important to have researchers out there participating uh, in this process as well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spin off on that, and I'm going to uh, ask you a follow-up question, John, and I'm going to give the word to Getz, because I think that could be an interesting uh, follow-on. Um, let's see if we can get some less static CS. So Felix mentioned the role of companies in attributions. Should companies attribute states then? And that leads me to my uh, second question, which is you know, to attribute do we perhaps need less anonymity online if we're going to have private actors do attributions? Do they need to be less anonymous, so to say? And I'm going to give that to Getz then to, to talk a little bit about uh, you know, who should attribute if we do have irresponsible state behavior and uh, what's the role of anonymity in that uh, after John uh, gets back. Yeah. Uh, we've gotten schooled on the differences in the, you know, the way in a technology company we talk about attribution and the way governments talk about attribution. Um, so we talk about it in a sense of accountability, identifying who did it. Um, governments talk about it as a political declaration of responsibility. Uh, and so to avoid confusion, we don't attribute, right? Because that's, that has special meaning um, for governments. But we do promote accountability. We think it's incredibly important to have more accountability in the system, precisely because these activities are so easily done um, in transparently. Uh, and so um, that, that is why we go out with public announcements of what we do when we detect, with customers' permission, um, when we detect foreign attacks. Uh, and I believe it's uh, 10,000 accounts we've now notified that, that their account has been subject to uh, attack by a foreign actor. So um, that is important to us. Um, there is the same question that always gets into, you know, your sources and methods, and if you reveal too much, you know, you'll lose your ability 
in the future to, um, to make the same kind of detections. But everybody's got that problem. Um, and so I think that it is important to create more accountability. Um, and after the uh, WannaCry attack uh, two years ago, um, it was the first time that, that we and some other major technology companies sat down and, and shared essentially our scientific evidence of what do we know about this attack and who is behind it. Uh, and we shared that with governments as well. Uh, and then we also took cooperative action among the companies to essentially disable uh, North Korea's um, infrastructure on, on across our platforms. So I think it is important that companies take action. Uh, you know, we need to take responsibility for the technology that we've created, the way it's actually used in the world. You know, we can't just say we're going to be responsible for the way we wanted it to be used. Um, and so I think that the level of accountability for companies uh, needs to go up as well. The participation in the internet and the sharing of information under the blanket of anonymity has been um, a huge problem. I think we can all agree with that. And when we are demanding more accountability, it's not only accountability to platforms, but also to people who participate online. When people are participating in sharing disinformation, they need to be held accountable in many ways. I mean, if they are just sharing uh, disinformation, one of our grantees here in Germany is Correctiv, which uh, it's an organization that works with Facebook, and they have this Pinocchio sign. So every time when a user tries to share content that's been identified by Correctiv through fact-checking as uh, false information, this little icon shows up and shows them how long the nose of this little Pinocchio is. To, to demonstrate how bad this information actually is. So this is a very, very simple way, for example, to create accountability. But we are far further than that right now because we are not only talking about disinformation when we're talking about participation in the internet and accountability. Of course, we also mean hate speech and stuff like that. And things that cross the law and in these cases, anonymity must not be the blanket to, um, uh, for, 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 to protect the, uh, the, the people who disseminate this kind of information. We need rules in the internet. We need rules that are based on the user side, of course, codes of conduct, but we also need rules to ensure if somebody is breaching, crossing red lines, as we are saying, not only as a company, but also as an individual. We need those rules in order to view behind the blanket of anonymity and hold people accountability for the disinformation, for the harmful information they are spreading. Uh, uh, Guts, as you know, in many countries like uh, Russia, for instance, uh, GPTIQ content, for instance, would be criminal. So would you want the cloak of in anonymity to be lifted on them as well? Or do we want to have these rules only for functioning Western democracies for as long as they're still functioning? Well, as you may know, we are no longer operate in Russia anymore. <laughs> so uh, of course, we are, so we are particularly taking a look at functioning democratic societies where there are institutions of democracy are working. When we're talking about contexts like Russia, about contexts like China, we have a completely different monster to deal with. And of course, there the anonymity is a very important uh, method in um, spreading ideas of open society values. But when we're talking in these contexts, it's very important to address that it's not necessarily Russia that's under attack. Russia is attacking uh, free democracies. They would just like us. They would definitely have a different view on that, most definitely. But we are also allowed to have a, a very specific view on that because we also have very, in, very increasing, uh, intriguing evidence about that. So, uh, yeah, my, what I'm saying is I'm addressing that at functioning democracies. Sorry, yeah. I'm going to ask you, Marilla, to, uh, to ask if you have any comments to this uh, last round of questions. Um, before I do that, um, I'm just going to, um, because after that, I'm going to open up uh, to questions from the audience. Um, and um, by the end of this session, I'm also going to ask the rapporteur to uh, come up with some of the main conclusions from today's sessions. 
uh, before we carry on. Um, but uh, before I, um, you don't have to put your hands up yet because I'm going to ask Marilia to, uh, um, to see if she has any f final uh, comments from this last round, specifically relating to the issue of uh, anonymity, attribution, and how do we deal with uh, these things as we try to hold state accountable and determine where a red line has been drawn? Yeah, very briefly so we can open the floor. Um, I believe that it's very important to frame this discussion um, as, as we did in terms of transparency, accountability, and improving attribution, both in technical and political terms, and not uh, bring the debate to questioning anonymity, because anonymity has been a very important tool to protect um, free speech and, and privacy online. And we just need to remind ourselves that the application of human rights in the international arena in security debates is something that is still um, fragile. We don't have a consensus in the international debate if human rights apply or not to foreign citizens, and states have responsibilities um, to protect and respect human rights when it comes to their own nationals. However, there are states such as the United States that contest, for instance, that mass surveillance um, against uh, foreign citizens would counter uh, human rights obligations internationally. So I think that we, can, we need to do whatever we can um, to protect the human rights standards that we have, and the concept of anonymity has been a cornerstone for the protection of free speech and, and, and privacy. Thank you for that. Okay, now I will uh, open up for questions. I'd ask you to um, say who you are and who you're directing your questions from. I'm going to uh, save up to about uh, three or four questions, depending on the scope of the questions, uh, before I let the panelists answer them. I'm just going to go uh, uh, down this line, because I see hands on this side, so I'm going to start there, and now I'm going to take the two and uh, three gentlemen on the side. So, Hi. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hans Klein. I'm from, the, uh, from Georgia Tech. And uh, I'm concerned that programs to combat disinformation can become programs to combat domestic dissent. And I'm concerned sometimes that governments, I wonder sometimes, are they protecting the public uh, or are governments protecting themselves from a dissent in the public? That's a concern I have. And I'll give you two examples of people who I've interacted with. One is the journalist Seymour Hirsch, Cy Hirsch. He's an a investigative reporter. He exposed the pris Abu Ghraib prison scandal in Iraq. It was very damaging to U.S foreign policy. He earlier exposed the My Lai massacre in Vietnam, very damaging to U.S. policy. Cy Hirsch says that he cannot get published anymore in U.S. media. He says he's effectively silenced. A uh, second person, MIT professor uh, Ted Postel, a former colleague of mine, he exposed the Patriot missile failures during the Iraq war. He also then questioned the chemical attacks and the attribution to Syria of chemical attacks in Duma. These, these exposures were very, his claims were very damaging to U.S. policy. Uh, he also says he can no longer be published in U.S. media. Both of these investigative reporters um, are on RT and, and on other media outlets that have been uh, claimed to be fake news outlets. Uh, so I'm concerned that, uh, that, that, in, that in fighting fake news, we're fighting dissent and, and possibly that efforts to protect the open society may kill the open society or damage the open society. And a final comment, I'm doing a workshop on this topic related to this next week at Georgia Tech. But, but in any case, I'm concerned that, ab about protecting dissent when we fight what's called fake news and disinformation. Um, I'm going to take more questions, but just to, uh, is there anyone specifically who you'd like to answer that, or is it a free-for-all question? Well, um, the gentleman from the Open Society, I found you were actually were the, the strongest in your uh, concerns about controlling, it's on controlling information, and the gentleman from Microsoft, I found uh, your comments very interesting in seeking a balance between openness and, and combating it. Um, let's take the gentleman in the blue darkish uh, jacket. Is that a second? Yes, sir. Hmm? Yes. Good morning. My name is Juan Fernandez. I'm from the Ministry of Communication of Cuba. I'm a little bit disappointed that in this um, supposed to be thorough ex examine of this information, with the exception of Marilia and a passing reference to Fox News by uh, the other gentleman there, nobody mentions the main source of this information in today's world, that is the big media conglomerate 
of the world, and mainly the Americans, but not only Americans, so Globo in Brazil, Prisa in Spain, and some other in, in, in some other countries. And usually this is done with the blessing, even the encouragement of the political um, lines of the governments in, in those countries. Uh, it, as the previous, uh, from the audience says, we have plenty of examples. One of the most striking is the coverage that is doing uh, nowadays of the unrest that is happening in several parts of the world. It's very dif different, the coverage, for instance, about what's happening in Hong Kong, but with what happened in Ecuador and what's happening right now in Bolivia after, after the, the coup or what is happening in Chile. It's very different. And so that is a way of using this information with, for political uh, purposes. And that is not new because we are being quoted by of many uh, distinguished academic articles. There's a book that it has also more than a decade by Schwamsky about manufacturing consent that explains very clearly why this happens. So I will really ask the distinguished panel to be uh, um, fair in the treatment of this uh, issue and not only singularize some countries like Russia and whatever and all the usual suspects and also to get into the country that is, has been record that is the country that has more interference in foreign affairs of the rest of the countries of the world. And I think that we should dig in there before putting the blame in the other. You know, everybody has a glass ceiling here. Thank you. And um, yes, sir. Yes, uh, my name is Alexander Malkevich. I am a journalist and civil society activist from Russia, a member of the Civic Chamber of Russian Federation. I heard uh, here a lot of words about Russia as a monster in social media. Yes, so I'm a red-bearded representative of this country. And first of all, uh, I want to say several words about interference in the elections, in the our elections from abroad. For example, this year in September, we had elections in the Moscow City Council, and during the whole election day, there were a lot of fake news about those elections, and uh, they were spreading on the platform of uh, Google, in Google services, uh, on YouTube. But when uh, the Moscow City uh, Election Commission decided to publish answers to those fake news, they couldn't do it on the platform on Facebook. Uh, they couldn't do it uh, on their own Facebook account because Facebook didn't allow Moscow City Election Commission, they didn't allow them to publish answers to this fake news. And this is a real interference from abroad to our elections. And second thing is about rules uh, and red lines. Uh, for example, on Twitter, and uh, one of the panelists uh, have mentioned uh, those rules. A month ago, a big new media project uh, appeared on Twitter called uh, The Good News from Russia. Uh, one month and uh, about six million uh, viewers, and this project uh, was banned. Uh, Twitter uh, puts it away because uh, Twitter didn't want uh, good news from Russia to be published on uh, its platform without any explanation, without any rules, without any red lines, just no good news from Russia. And the second, uh, not the third thing, one of the panelists uh, mentioned the new Oxford papers, uh, Oxford researchers uh, about social media. So uh, can I have a look after the panel on it? Because uh, you have such a lot of um, researchers about the bad role of Russia. So I want to know uh, new, new facts. Thank you. 
Um, alrighty, I hope we can manage one more round of questions uh, after we've gone through this. So we have about 10 minutes left of the panel, so I'll ask you to keep it brief. I think we'll, we'll, we'll go down the line. Um, questions being, uh, is there a risk of we're actually fighting internal dissent? Is there a risk of uh, false attribution or bias in attribution? Uh, the role of uh, politics in fighting, uh, in uh, encountering uh, foreign interference? Um, and how do we draw this line, which I think actually these questions come back to in the end. How do we keep this fair and balanced, so to say? And I'll start with John. Just, <clears throat> it is very important to preserve a role for freedom of expression while trying to create more resilience in the system. Um, Fact-checking has been deployed as, as a possible solution. The solution that I prefer is a, a group called NewsGuard, which rates on journalistic criteria um, the nine factors uh, of the news site itself, um, and based on those criteria, gives a little green check or a little red check when, when the news story pops up. So, but I think it's there, they're trying, it's, it's run by professional journalists, uh, and they've got a very transparent process for it, but they're not trying to prevent news, they're just trying to give some indication about the professional journalism of the site. Um, so I think that's, that to me is a, one way to, to balance these things. And certainly no one's claiming that there's never been foreign interference in Russian elections. Um, to the contrary, I think we all recognize that this is a growing problem. There is a concern, though, that you know uh, we can have an escalating cycle where we continue to have more and more intervention, uh, and I think that becomes destabilizing for the world. My question? The, uh, on, on the question, so the EU has an actor agnostic approach to, to foreign disinformation. Uh, all evidence shows us, however, that Russia and the Russian Federation's uh, government and uh, government proxies are the, the main actor in this field as re uh, regards uh, the European Union and uh, Eastern Partnership audiences. We have documented more than 7,000 cases of Russian disinformation on our publicly available website, eu versus thisinfo.eu. And yeah, I'm going to let the evidence speak for itself. But show, show them, show those uh, 7,000 facts where they are published. Yes. Because uh, we have, we have plenty of facts from, uh, about disinformation from foreign media yes. speaking about Russia. I, I just told you where to find the evidence. Weapons yes. of mass destruction yeah. in Iraq. I guess, yeah, I think on that topic has been uh, said enough, but I want to address what uh, you've been um, saying. I mean, it's very unfortunate that um, legitimate research has been, uh, or people who have published critical research from reputable organizations, universities, have uh, issues to uh, become visible in the public and that uh, outlets like RT then are the only means for them to become visible again. First of all, that's, that's really an issue. That's an issue on how society deals with critical information. We see that in uh, various countries when it comes to whistleblowing and things like that. So critical information is always sensitive and there needs to be a societal acceptance that there are truths out there we may not like but are still factual. So that's very important. But um, to use outlets like RT, I'm not saying that all information RT is uh, broadcasting is false information. But what I want to go back to is well, to the statement I've made in the beginning. We are talking about false narratives. And in false narratives, we have elements in the narrative that display factual truth, but are skewed and used in different contexts. I do not know the cases of your colleagues. But we do not know what, how this information is being processed further and what kind of agenda. So we always have to be very careful when we're thinking about the channels we're using for the dissemination of information, not to only make sure that's the correct information that's being transported, 
but it's also I have to think about what outlet that is and what outlet this what this outlet would do with this kind of information. But it is a shame that your colleagues have not uh, have any access to uh, other media outlets and possibilities to publish their their, their information. And this brings us to the. Um, uh, to, to the uh, other issue that when we are talking about disinformation, I said that we need to talk about human rights there, and that's the freedom of expression, and the society needs to tolerate a various degree on different opinions, and people are entitled to lie, that's not a crime, they can do that, and we also need to be able to withstand that criticism as a society as a whole. We, uh, we have a uh, German uh, name for that, that's the Wehrhafte Demokratie, the democracy that can protect itself. And for that, we need all party, all members of society to expose false information, but also to support the good information that's all out there. Thanks. Thank you. I would also like to make a quick comment on the misleading confusion between uh, disinformation and domestic dissent, but connect it to the international discussions that are taking place in the UNGG. Because I think it's very interesting that, historically speaking, the GGE, we had a stark division between countries that frame the debates as cybersecurity debates and countries that frame the debate as information security debates. And the division line was uh, US, uh, Europe, and allies on the one side, and then China, Russia um, on the other side. But I think that this confusion that we are starting to see um, in democratic countries like the US and others, um, Perhaps it points to a starting of a convergence between the ideas of information and security and, and cybersecurity. And I'm wondering, I don't have insider information. If any of you have, perhaps it would be good um, to have a discussion on that, how this will affect future debates in the UN and GTE. Um, the other point, just to respond to, to Juan on the concentration of traditional media, I think this is a very, very uh, important uh, problem that we have in many regions of the world, including Brazil. All our immediate channels from radio, television to newspapers are controlled by four families that have a very clear um, political agenda. So yes, there's this information coming from traditional media for sure. However, in the last Brazilian elections, what we saw was that the traditional media was picking up information coming from social media and social media especially whatsapp groups they were much more decisive when it comes to informing people and and building opinions than traditional uh, media so i think that there is a reverse of the situation um, there that needs to be uh, better understood this process of uh, fake news or misleading information using the rubber stamp of traditional media to reinforce a certain information and traditional media picking up uh, misleading information from social media channels and not doing their, their due um, 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 responsibility of fact-checking. Thank you. I think um, while we've had different opinions, especially when it comes to the third pillar that I highlighted when it comes to political interference, so far I've heard a lot of agreement when it comes to one clear red line, and that is interference in election infrastructure and voter disenfranchisement as to clear red lines that is not acceptable. Now, we are running out of time. We only have three minutes left, so I'm not, unfortunately not going to open up to any more questions. But I am going to ask the rapporteur uh, to uh, uh, come with some final remarks regarding the main question uh, of public diplomacy versus disinformation. Can we see a clear red line here? Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you. Uh, there is a lot to cover in this session, so I will try to pull together some key points as I see them. And given the time, like you said, I'll try and be as brief as possible. So some interesting criteria were mentioned to measure disinformation. So to go to what John Frank mentioned earlier, the uh, five criteria, transparency, extent, uh, purpose, scale, and what are the effects. I think these are an important way to measure disinformation and foreign interference. Uh, the importance of seeking a balance between openness and combating disinfo is, is a key headline, I think, of today's discussion, and I look forward to integrating that into a report. Uh, there is a lot of discussion around definitions. Agreement, however, perhaps there is a need for clearer definitions on what might constitute interference, foreign interference, or simply domestic political activities. Uh, some discussion around the application of international legal norms and frameworks and uh, international principles, and I think that is a conversation we need to continue to have. 
And uh, what there has been overarching agreement on is that this is a phenomenon beyond uh, what we have dealt with in the past in terms of scale and the effects that it's had on society, especially in functioning democratic societies, and that we need to come up with brand new formulas to deal with the issues. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming and attending this panel. Um, we have a minute left, and uh, the key role of the moderator is to finish on time, so I'm going to do that. I want to stop by thanking Microsoft and Stifter Neue Verantwortung for arranging this panel, bringing together uh, the panelists, and of course to all the panelists for being here. Uh, my final remark is that this continues to be, a, uh, and this will continue to be a discussion for the coming years, and there's, there's a, a lot of opinions, there's, there's a lot of thoughts, and uh, uh, this will not be the final panel on this topic, we can be sure of that. Thank you very much. <laughs>